Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight, two stories from Edward Dunsany, better known as Lord Dunsany. The Three Sailors' Gambit and The Ghosts. The Three Sailors' Gambit. Sitting some years ago in the ancient tavern at Over, one afternoon in spring, as was my custom, for something strange to happen. In this I was not always disappointed for the very curious leaded panes of that tavern, facing the sea, let a light into the low-ceilinged room so mysterious, particularly at evening, that it somehow seemed to affect the events within. Be that as it may, I have seen strange things in that tavern, and heard stranger things told. And as I sat there, three sailors entered the tavern, just back, as they said, from sea, and come with sunburned skins from a very long voyage to the south, and one of them had a board and chessman under his arm, and they were complaining that they could find no one who knew how to play chess. This was the year that the tournament was in England, and a little dark man at a table in the corner of the room, drinking sugar and water, asked them why they wished to play chess, and they said that they would play any man for a pound. They opened their box of chessmen then, a cheap and nasty set, and the man refused to play with such uncouth pieces, and the sailor suggested that perhaps he could find better ones, and in the end he went round to his lodgings nearby and brought his own, and then they sat down to play for a pound aside. It was a consultation game on the part of the sailors. They said that all three must play. Well, the little dark man turned out to be Stablecrats. Of course he was fabulously poor, and the sovereign meant more to him than it did to the sailors, but he didn't seem keen to play. It was the sailors that insisted. He had made the badness of the sailor's chessmen an excuse for not playing at all, but the sailors had overruled that, and then he told them straight out who he was, and the sailors had never heard of Stablocrats. Well, no more was said after that. Stablocrats said no more, either because he did not wish to boast, or because he was huffed that they did not know who he was. And I saw no reason to enlighten the sailors about him. If he took their pound, they had brought it upon themselves, and my boundless admiration for his genius made me feel that he deserved whatever might come his way. He had not asked to play. They had named the stakes, he had warned them, and gave them the first move. There was nothing unfair about Stablocrats. I had never seen Stablocrats before, but I had played over nearly every one of his games in the World Championship for the last three or four years. He was always, of course, the model chosen by students. Only young chess players can appreciate my delight at seeing him play firsthand. Well, the sailors used to lower their heads almost as low as the table and mutter together before every move, but they muttered so low that you could not hear what they planned. They lost three pawns almost straight off, then a knight, and shortly after, a bishop. They were playing, in fact, the famous three sailors' gambit. Stablocrats was playing with the easy confidence that they say was usual with him, when suddenly at about the thirteenth move I saw him look surprised. He leaned forward and looked at the board, and then at the sailors, but he learned nothing from their vacant faces. He looked back at the board again. He moved more deliberately after that. The sailors lost two more pawns. Stablocrats had lost nothing as yet. He looked at me, I thought, almost irritably, as though something would happen that he wished I was not there to see. I believed at first that he had qualms about taking the sailor's pound, until it dawned on me that he might lose the game. I saw that possibility in his face, not on the board, for the game had become almost incomprehensible to me. I cannot describe my astonishment, and a few moves later, Stablocrats resigned. The sailor showed no more elation than if they had won some game with greasy cards playing among themselves. Stablocrats asked them where they got their opening. We kind of thought of it, said one. It just came into our heads like, said another. He asked them questions about the ports they had touched at. He evidently thought, as I did myself, that they had learned their extraordinary gambit, perhaps in some old dependency of Spain, from some young master of chess, whose fame had not reached Europe. He was very eager to find out who this man could be, for neither of us imagined that these sailors had invented it, nor would anyone who had seen them. But he got no information from the sailors. Stablocrats could very ill afford the loss of a pound, 
he offered to play them again for the same stakes. The sailors began to set up the white pieces. Stavlokratz pointed out that it was his turn for the first move. The sailors agreed, but continued to set up the white pieces and sat with the white before them, waiting for him to move. It was a trivial incident, but it revealed to Stavlokratz and myself that none of these sailors was aware that white always moves first. Stavlokratz played them on his own opening, reasoning, of course, that if they had never heard of Stavlokratz, they would not know of his opening. And with probably a very good hope of getting back his pound, he played the fifth variation with its tricky seventh move, at least so he intended, but it turned to a variation unknown to the students of Stavlokratz. Throughout this game I watched the sailors closely, and I became sure, as only an attentive watcher can be, that the one on their left, Jim Bunyan, did not even know the moves. When I had made up my mind about this, I watched only the other two, Adam Bailey and Bill Sloggs, trying to make out which was the mastermind. And for a long while I could not. And then I heard Adam Bailey mutter six words, the only words I heard throughout the game, of all their consultations. No, him with the horse's head. And I decided that Adam Bailey did not know what a knight was, though of course he might have been explaining things to Bill Sloggs, but it did not sound like that. So that left Bill Sloggs. I watched Bill Sloggs after that with a certain wonder. He was no more intellectual than the others to look at, though rather more forceful, perhaps. Poor old Stavlokratz was beaten again. Well, in the end I paid for Stavlokratz and tried to get a game with Bill Sloggs alone, but this he would not agree to. It must be all three or none. And then I went back with Stavlokratz to his lodgings. He very kindly gave me a game. Of course, it did not last long, but I am prouder of having been beaten by Stavlokratz than of any game that I have ever won. And then we talked for an hour about the sailors, and neither of us could make head or tail of them. I told him what I had noticed about Jim Bunyan and Adam Bailey, and he agreed with me that Bill Sloggs was the man, though as how he had come by that gambit, or that variation of Stavlokratz' own opening, he had no theory. I had the sailor's address, which was that tavern as much as anywhere, and they were to be there all evening. As evening drew in, I went back to the tavern and found there still the three sailors. I offered Bill Sloggs two pounds for a game with him alone, and he refused, but in the end he played me for a drink. And then I found that he had not heard of the en passant rule, and believed that the fact of checking the king prevented him from castling, and did not know that a player can have two or more queens on the board at the same time if he queens his pawns, or that a pawn could ever become a knight, and he made as many of the stock mistakes as he had time for in a short game, which I won. I thought that I should have got at the secret then, but his mates who sat scowling the whole while in the corner came up and interfered. It was a breach of their compact, apparently, for one to play by himself. At any rate, they seemed angry. So I left the tavern then and came back the next day, and the next day, and the day after, and often saw the sailors, but none were in a communicative mood. I had got Stavlokratz to keep away, and they could get no one to play chess at a pound a side, and I would not play with them unless they told me the secret. And then one evening I found Jim Bunyan drunk, not yet so drunk as he wished, for the two pounds were spent, and I gave him very nearly a tumbler of whiskey, or what passed for whiskey in that tavern at Over, and he told me the secret at once. I had given the others some whiskey to keep them quiet, and later on in the evening they must have gone out, but Jim Bunyan stayed with me by a little table, leaning across it and talking low, right into my face, his breath smelling all the while of what passed for whiskey. The wind was blowing outside as it does on bad nights in November, coming up with moans from the south, towards which the tavern faced with all its leaded panes, so that none but I was able to hear his voice as Jim Bunyan gave up his secret. They had sailed for years, he told me, with Bill Snythe, and on their last voyage home, Bill Snythe had died, and he was buried at sea. Just the other side of the line they buried him, and his pals divided his kit, and these three got his crystal that only they knew he had, which Bill got one night in Cuba. They played chess with the crystal. And he was going on to tell me about that night in Cuba when Bill had bought the crystal from the stranger, how some folks might think they had seen thunderstorms, 
but let them go and listen to the one that thundered in Cuba when Bill was buying his crystal, and they'd find that they didn't know what thunder was. But then I interrupted him, unfortunately perhaps, for it broke the thread of his trail and sent him rambling a while, and cursing other people and talking of other lands, China, Port Said, and Spain, but I brought him back to Cuba again in the end. I asked him how they could play chess with a crystal, and he said that you looked at the board and looked at the crystal, and there was the game in the crystal, the same as it was on the board, with all the odd little pieces looking just the same, though smaller, horses' heads and whatnots, and as soon as the other man moved, the move came out in the crystal, and then your move appeared after it, and all you had to do was make it on the board. If you didn't make the move that you saw in the crystal, things got very bad in it, something horribly mixed and moving about rapidly, and scowling and making the same move over and over again, and the crystal getting cloudier and cloudier. It was best to take one's eyes away from it then, but one dreamt about it afterwards, and the foul little pieces came, and cursed you in your sleep, and moved about all the night with their crooked moves. I thought then that, drunk though he was, he was not telling the truth, and I promised to show him to people who played chess all their lives, so that he and his mates could get a pound whenever they liked, and I promised not to reveal his secret even to Stavlokrats, if only he would tell me the truth. And this promise I have kept, till long after the three sailors have lost their secret. I told him straight out that I did not believe in the crystal. Well, Jim Bunyan leaned forward then, even further across the table, and swore he had seen the man from whom Bill had bought the crystal, and that he was the one to whom anything was possible. To begin with, his hair was villainously dark, and his features were unmistakable even down there in the south, and he could play chess with his eyes shut, and even then he could beat anybody in Cuba. But there was more than this. There was a bargain he made with Bill that told one who he was. He sold that crystal for Bill Snythe's soul. Jim Bunyan, leaning over the table with his breath in my face, nodded his head several times and was silent. I began to question him then. Did they play chess as far away as Cuba? He said they all did. Was it conceivable that any man would make such a bargain as Snythe had? Wasn't the trick well known? Wasn't it in hundreds of books? And if he couldn't read books, mustn't he have heard from sailors that it was the devil's commonest dodge to get souls from silly people? Jim Bunyan had leant back in his own chair quietly smiling at my questions, but when I mentioned silly people he leaned forward again, and thrust his face close to mine, and asked me several times if I called Bill Snythe silly. It seemed that these three sailors thought a great deal of Bill Snythe, and it made Jim Bunyan angry to hear anything said against him. I hastened to say that the bargain seemed silly, though not, of course, the man who made it. For the sailor was almost threatening. And no wonder, for the whiskey in that dim tavern would madden a nun. When I said that the bargain seemed silly, he smiled again, and then he thundered his fist down on the table and said that no one had ever yet got the best of Bill Snythe and that that was the worst bargain for himself that the devil ever made and that from all he had read or heard of the devil he had never been so badly had before as the night when he met Bill Snythe at the inn in the thunderstorm in Cuba for Bill Snythe already had the damnedest soul at sea. Bill was a good fellow, but his soul was damned right enough, so he got the crystal for nothing. Yes, he was there and saw it all himself, Bill Snythe in the Spanish Inn and the candles flaring and the devil walking in and out of the rain and then the bargain between these two old hands and the devil going out into the lightning and the thunderstorm raging on and Bill Snythe sitting chuckling to himself between the bursts of the thunder. But I had more questions to ask and interrupted this reminiscence. Why did they all three always play together? and a look of something like fear came over Jim Bunyan's face, and at first he would not speak, and then he said to me that it was like this. They had not paid for that crystal, but got it as their share of Bill Snythe's kit. If they had paid for it, or given something in exchange to Bill Snythe, that would have been all right. But they couldn't do that now, because Bill was dead, and they were not sure if the old bargain might not hold good, and hell must be a large and lonely place, and to go there alone must be bad. And so the three agreed that they would all stick together, and use the crystal all three or not at all, unless one died, 
and then the two would use it, and the one that was gone would wait for them, and the last of the three of them to go would take the crystal with him, or maybe the crystal would bring him. They didn't think, they said, they were the kind of men for heaven, and he hoped they knew their place better than that. But they didn't fancy the notion of hell alone, if hell it had to be. It was all right for Bill Snythe, he was afraid of nothing. He had known perhaps five men that were not afraid of death, but Bill Snythe was not afraid of hell. He died with a smile on his face like a child in its sleep. It was drink killed poor Bill Snythe. This is why I had beaten Bill Sloggs. Sloggs had the crystal on him when we played, but would not use it. These sailors seemed to fear loneliness, as some people fear being hurt. He was the only one of the three who could play chess at all. He had learned it in order to be able to answer questions and keep up their pretense, but he had learned it badly, as I found. I never saw the crystal. They never showed it to anyone. But Bill Bunyan told me that night that it was about the size that the thick end of a hen's egg would be if it were round. And then he fell asleep. There were many more questions that I would have asked him, but I could not wake him up. I even pulled the table away so that he fell to the floor, but he slept on, and all the tavern was dark but for one candle burning. And it was then that I noticed for the first time that the other two sailors had gone. No one remained at all but Jim Bunyan and I, and the sinister barman of that curious inn, and he too was asleep. When I saw that it was impossible to wake the sailor, I went out into the night. Next day Jim Bunyan would talk of it no more, and when I went back to Stablecrat's, I found him already putting on paper his theory about the sailors, which became accepted by chess players, that one of them had been taught their curious gambit, and that the other two between them had learnt all the defensive openings as well as general play. Though who taught them, no one could say, in spite of inquiries made afterwards all along the southern Pacific. I never learned any more details from any of the three sailors. They were always too drunk to speak, or else not drunk enough to be communicative. I seemed just to have taken Bill Bunyan at the flood. But I kept my promise. It was I that introduced them to the tournament, and a pretty mess they made of established reputations. And so they kept on for months, never losing a game, and always playing for their pound aside. I used to follow them wherever they went, merely to watch them play. They were more marvelous than Stablecrats, even in his youth. But then they took to liberties such as giving their queen when playing first-class players. And in the end one day, when all three were drunk, they played the best player in England with only a row of pawns. They won that game all right. But the ball broke to pieces. I never smelt such a stench in all my life. The three sailors took it stoically enough. They signed on to different ships and went back again to the sea, and the world of chess lost sight, forever I trust, who would have altogether spoiled the game. The End The Ghosts The argument that I had with my brother in his great lonely house will scarcely interest my readers, not those, at least, whom I hope may be attracted by the experiment that I undertook, and by the strange things that befell me in that hazardous region, into which so lightly and so ignorantly I allowed my fancy to enter. It was at Anale that I visited him. Now Anale stands in a wide isolation, in the midst of a dark gathering of old whispering cedars. They nod their heads together when the north wind comes, and nod again and agree, and furtively grow still again, and say no more a while. The north wind is to them like a nice problem among wise old men. They nod their heads over it, and mutter about it all together. They know much, these cedars. They have been there so long. Their grandsires knew Lebanon, and grandsires of these were servants of the king of Tyre, and came to Solomon's court. And amidst these black-haired children of the gray-headed time stood the old house of Anale. I know not how many centuries had lashed against it their evanescent form of years, but it was still unshattered, and all about it were things of long ago, as cling strange growths to some sea-defying rock. Here, like the shells of long-dead limpets, was armor that men encased themselves in long ago. Here, too, were tapestries of many colors, beautiful as seaweed. No modern flotsam ever drifted hither, no early Victorian furniture, no electric light. The great trade routes that littered the years with empty meat tins and cheap novels 
We're far from here. Well, well, the centuries will shatter it and drive its fragments on to distant shores. Meanwhile, while it yet stood, I went on a visit there to my brother, and we argued about ghosts. My brother's intelligence on this subject seemed to me to be in need of correction. He mistook things imagined for things having actual existence. He argued that second-hand evidence of persons having seen ghosts proved ghosts to exist. I said that even if they had seen ghosts, this was no proof at all. Nobody believes that there are red rats, though there is plenty of first-hand evidence of men having seen them in delirium. Finally, I said I would see ghosts myself and continue to argue against their actual existence. So I collected a handful of cigars and drank several cups of very strong tea and went without my dinner and retired into a room where there was dark oak and all the chairs were covered with tapestry and my brother went to bed bored with our argument and trying hard to dissuade me from making myself uncomfortable. All the way up the old stairs, as I stood at the bottom of them, and as his candle went winding up and up, I heard him still trying to persuade me to have supper and go to bed. It was a windy winter, and outside the cedars were muttering I know not what about, but I think that they were Tories of a school long dead, and were troubled about something new. Within, a great damp log upon the fireplace began to squeak and sing, and struck up a whining tune, and a tall flame stood up over it and beat time, and all the shadows crowded round and round and began to dance. In distant corners, old masses of darkness sat like chaperones and never moved. Over there, in the darkest part of the room, stood a door that was always locked. It led into the hall, and no one ever used it. Near the door something had happened once, of which the family are not proud. We do not speak of it. There in the firelight stood the venerable forms of the old chairs. The hands that had made their tapestries lay far beneath the soil. With the needles with which they were wrought were many separate flakes of rust. No one wove now in that old room. No one but the assiduous ancient spiders who, watching by the deathbed of things of yore, worked shrouds to hold their dust. In shrouds about the cornices already lay the heart of the oak wainscot that the worm had eaten out. Surely at such an hour, in such a room, a fancy already excited by hunger and strong tea might see the ghosts of former occupants. I expected nothing less. The fire flickered and the shadows danced. Memories of strange historic things rose vividly in my mind. But midnight chimed solemnly from a seven-foot clock, and nothing happened. My imagination would not be hurried, and the chill that was within the small hours had come upon me, and I had already abandoned myself to sleep, when in the hall adjoining there arose a rustling of silk dresses that I had waited for and expected. Then there entered two by two the high-born ladies and their gallants of Jacobean times. They were little more than shadows, very dignified shadows, and almost indistinct. But you have all read ghost stories before. You have all seen in museums the dresses of those times. There is little need to describe them. They entered, several of them, and sat down on the old chairs, perhaps a little carelessly, considering the value of the tapestries. Then the rustling of their dresses ceased. Well, I had seen ghosts, and was neither frightened nor convinced that ghosts existed. I was about to get up out of my chair and go to bed, when there came the sound of pattering in the hall, a sound of bare feet coming over the polished floor, and every now and then a foot would slip, and I heard claws scratching along the wood as some four-footed thing lost and regained its balance. I was not frightened, but uneasy. The pattering came straight towards the room that I was in. Then I heard the sniffing of expectant nostrils. Perhaps uneasy was not the most suitable word to describe my feelings then. Suddenly a herd of black creatures larger than bloodhounds came galloping in. They had large, pendulous ears. Their noses were to the ground sniffing. They went up to the lords and ladies of long ago and fawned about them disgustingly. Their eyes were horribly bright and ran down to great depths. When I looked at them I knew suddenly what these creatures were, and I was afraid. They were the sins, the filthy, immortal sins of those courtly men and women. How demure she was, that lady that sat near me on an old world chair. 
how demure she was, and how fair, to have beside her, with a jowl upon her lap, a sin with such cavernous red eyes, a clear case of murder. And you, yonder lady with the golden hair, surely not you, and yet that fearful beast with the yellow eyes slinks from you to yonder courtier there, and whenever one drives it away, it slinks back to the other. Over there, a lady tries to smile as she strokes the loathsome furry head of another's sin, but one of her own is jealous and intrudes itself under her hand. Here sits an old nobleman with his grandson on his knee, and one of the great black sins of the grandfather is licking the child's face and has made the child its own. Sometimes a ghost would move and seek another chair, but always his pack of sins would move behind him. Poor ghosts! How many flights they must have attempted for two hundred years from their hated sins! How many excuses they must have given for their presence! And the sins were with them still, and still unexplained. Suddenly one of them seemed to scent my living blood, and bayed horribly, and all the others left their ghosts at once, and dashed up to the sin that had given tongue. The brute had picked up my scent near the door by which I had entered, and they moved slowly nearer to me, sniffing along the floor, and uttering every now and then their fearful cry. I saw that the whole thing had gone too far. But now they had seen me. Now they were all about me. They sprang up trying to reach my throat, and whenever their claws touched me, horrible thoughts came into my mind, and unutterable desires dominated my heart. I planned bestial things, as these creatures leaped about me, and planned them with a masterly cunning. A great red-eyed murder was among the foremost of those furry things from whom I feebly strove to defend my throat. Suddenly it seemed to me good that I should kill my brother. It seemed important to me that I should not risk being punished. I knew where a revolver was kept. After I shot him, I would dress the body up and put flour on the face like a man who had been acting as a ghost. It would be very simple. I would say that he had frightened me, and the servants had heard us talking of ghosts. There were one or two trivialities that would have to be arranged, but nothing escaped my mind. Yet it seemed to me very good that I should kill my brother, as I looked into the red depths of this creature's eyes. But one last effort as they dragged me down, if two straight lines cut one another, I said, the opposite angles are equal. Let A B C D cut another one at E, and then the angle CEA, CEB equal two right angles, prop seven, also CEA, AED equal two right angles. I moved towards the door to get the revolver. A hideous exultation arose among the beasts. But the angle CEA is common, therefore AED equals CEB. In the same way, CEA equals DEB, QED. It was proved. Logic and reason re-established themselves in my mind. There were no dark hounds of sin. The tapestry chairs were empty. It seemed to me an inconceivable thought that a man should murder his brother. The End